The economy is in bad shape and I think it's going to get much, much worse. Recession sucks for most and if you know how to move in a recession, you could come out of it in good shape or even well off. In today's video, I'm going to give you the best advice I can and share my plan with you so that you could apply what resonates to your own life. My name is Carl Pierre and this is ENTP Life. The first thing that we need to talk about is what a recession is technically. A recession is two consecutive quarters where the GDP or the gross domestic product of an economy is less than it was in the same quarter of the previous year. Meaning, if the US economy did 5 trillion in transactions in the summer and fall of 2021, and then in 2022 only did 4.5 trillion for each respective quarter, we are in a recession. It doesn't sound that bad when you look at it in that way, but it's a whole lot deeper than two slow quarters. The reason it's deeper than just a pullback is because the people who get hurt the worst are those who are in the true working class. A lot of people are month to month and a lot of people are using revolving debt to manage their monthly expenses. I know it sounds terrible, but that's just the way that it is. And when the economy contracts, everyone reacts. No different than the working class having to adjust their lifestyle because things are getting more expensive or they don't have as much money coming in, companies do the same and the government does the same. So on the governmental level, what they do is they tend to stop printing as much money or authorizing the printing of more money, raise taxes, which of course puts a higher burden on the people, and they also cut back on investing in infrastructure, which creates jobs, as well as backing securities that are generated by the central bank. So overall, there's a decrease in money that's hitting the macro economy, and there is an increase in expenses on the taxpayers because the government has to kind of make up for the losses by increasing taxes so that they're able to fund some of the private or some of the infrastructure investing. It turns them to kind of cutting back on their employment, cutting back on investing in their business, because at the end of the day, they need to make money and the money is no longer being shoved or, or lent to them. So they have to extract it by raising prices, which doesn't always work, and by reducing expenses within the company. And in most companies, their highest expense outside of materials produce their products are the people who are providing the services and actually doing the work. So they look to become more efficient with less resources and figure out how to run their businesses without all this extra cash. And of course, the people who suffer the most are the workers because again, they're getting squeezed by the government in the form of taxes and their companies are starting to lay off, starting not to give wage increases, starting to cut out benefits. So they're getting clamped from both ends. And of course, when the masses, which is the middle class, the general public, when they are in a financial crunch, they look to leadership in the companies, they look to leadership in the government to solve their problems because that's what's been going on for years and the end result is potential mutiny. They get outraged, there's political swings, there's infighting. It's not a good look. And you could actually look back to the last financial crisis with the Occupy Wall Street movement. Once the unemployment rate was inching at 10% and there were more young people out of work loaded with student loan debt, loaded with retail debt, they went nuts and they blamed it on the corporations, which they should, but at the same time, it's still the person's own responsibility to manage how they spend their money. And that's what I mean by, you know, things get kind of shaky and it's not just about two slow quarters. On this channel, I talk about living globally and how to pull it off. If you want more information like this, make sure that you like this video, subscribe to the channel and share it with anybody that you know is thinking about taking the global plunge. Just as I've gone global, the economy is globally intertwined. South America is going through some socialist pains. China is on the verge of financial collapse. Europe is being held hostage by the energy crisis resulting from the war in the Ukraine. And in the United States, we're experiencing outrageous inflation caused mainly by printing money in the obtuse reaction to COVID. As I said before, and I'll say it again, the reaction to COVID-19 was absurd. It created greater divide in our country, hurt the economy, and really functioned, in my opinion, as a smokescreen to make the rich richer and probably destabilize China. I personally benefited from the pandemic and the inflation of asset prices, but looking around, it's pretty bad. I think we're marching into the worst economic crisis in my lifetime, and this entitled generation, as well as the polarized political scene, worries me the most. 
So what can you do to ease the blow? The first thing that you need to do is cut your damn expenses, especially the frivolous spending. Then use those savings to pay down revolving debt. You're going to see a lot more of Robert Kiyosaki. He's kind of a, a doomsday wizard and you'll start to see that kind of pop up in your YouTube feed about what he predicts. He always says that debt is money and in many cases it's true, but on the consumer level, debt is usually bad news. Most of the time people are taking out loans to pay for lifestyle sort of expenses. They're taking out loans on automobiles that probably they shouldn't shouldn't have. They take out money to buy useless things like clothes, which in almost always is just a depreciating asset. They spend money on these things, these things that they wish that they had when they didn't have money and things that don't necessarily produce cash. And that's what I would consider bad debt. If you've accumulated a bunch of this bad debt, I highly suggest that you pay it down in this particular order. The first thing that you should pay off, and this is gonna be contrary to like what most people think because a lot of people are thinking student loans. The first thing that you should pay off are your real credit cards, your pure MasterCards, Visas, American Express, those credit cards that have revolving debt. And the reason for that is because their interest rates are usually fairly high from month to month. And at the same time, if you pay down those credit cards, it keeps you in a pretty good credit worthiness position and at the same time, that's money that you can retap if ever there's a need. After your credit cards, you should then look at the next group that's eating up your money. And that's most likely going to be your auto loans and your home loan. Now with your auto loan and home loan, those are more or less fixed assets. Your home, for the most part, isn't a depreciating asset. It tends to appreciate over time. So paying that down a little more aggressively helps you in that it creates more equity and helps you to be a little more credit worthy if credit and money is flowing in that way. But at least it's kind of stored in this value storage uh, sort of vehicle. Now your car, on the other hand, same sort of thing. The debts that are reporting on your credit, the lower those debts are, the more credit worthy you are. A car unfortunately has a decreasing value over time and at least if you pay that off, you're not accumulating the interest, you have an asset free and clear. If you pay it off aggressively, you don't have to worry about the car bill, probably don't have to get the same level of insurance. So it helps to reduce your overall month to month carrying cost. And at the same time, if things really get rough, you could sell your car and downgrade to another vehicle and kind of use that, that difference in cash. You could reclaim that, what you've paid into it. You could reclaim it if you needed to use it on something else. Then you just have your student loan debt. I'm not a big fan of paying off student loan debt. It doesn't quite make any sense. Um, the interest rates are usually pretty good. They have a lot of forbearance options for you. Um, so you could put those on pause. And when you spend into your student loans, you don't really get much benefit out of it because if you really needed to reclaim that money, you can't. With your student loans, if you pay them off, it's just, hey, you've paid off your loan. So that's not something that I would do. But if you minimize your revolving debts and you maintain your job, the thing that ends up happening is that you're able to save more money. Having cash in the economic downturns is critical. Having good credit in the economic downturns typically prevents you from getting your lines of credit cut, keeps you in a nice position to potentially retap that credit for future use when things get better. The second thing that you need to do is learn how an economy actually works and the rules governing an economy. If you don't know how money works, you will never be able to play the game and win. Learn from what moves our economy and what signs to look for to know if you should be reserved or starting to invest again. While everyone else is in panic mode or getting crushed, you have to pay close attention to the facts, not the emotional headlines, but the real indicators like prices of assets stabilizing for some time or money re-entering the market. You also need to make sure you know where exactly you plan to invest and when things are showing signs of recovery. The next step is only for those who are up to leveling up in the next round. You have to start taking account of all the people in your life who are in a position to invest with you when the time is right. This is something that I learned coming out of the 2008, 2009 crash, is that in around 2012, people had already adjusted and started to be in a position where they had savings 
and a little more willing to dabble. And it was at that time that I started to raise money from friends and family to do my next wave of flips. And that period actually lasted for a solid eight years. And that was all made possible by first turning to the people that I know that had at least some money saved up. My minimum requirement was at least coming in with $5,000. So I was going to people for five, up to about $20,000 for the down payment, for the float money, et cetera. And that allowed me to give an above average return to my friends and family for investing with me. And at the same time, it allowed me to get the money that I needed to move in an environment where credit wasn't as free flowing. And that put me in a really good position to accumulate assets that benefited from growth during the time that that economy started to kind of grow and, and adjust. So just follow that pattern, follow this advice. And when we're coming out of this recession that's soon to come, it's, we're not even deep in it yet, it's just kind of, we're starting to hint at it. But when we start to come out of it, if you follow these steps, you're gonna be ultimately in a really good position to benefit from the negatives of the recession. And another thing that you should take away from this and learn is to control the excessive spending to control all the things that put you in a negative position. For years, people would laugh at me for driving a Fiat. I, a Fiat 500 that I bought for like, I don't know, twelve dollars or $13,000 met my needs because it was pretty good on gas, uh, a cheap car. And in reality, I knew from the last recession that the more that I keep my relative expenses low, like my, my expenses to support myself and my family, the lower I keep those, the better off I am because when things get stressful, I'm not gonna crack. I'm gonna be able to afford my lifestyle. In the place that I live, I don't pay rent. Why? Because it's a triplex, it's on Airbnb, that covers the mortgage, that covers the expenses on the house, I don't pay rent. One of my cars is fully paid off, the other one's on lease for like 300 bucks a month and I have one student loan that's like, a hundred bucks payment per month. All my other car credit cards are paid in full at the end of every month. I build my points there for travel. And I'm in a position where my personal debt is less than a thousand dollars a month to maintain the home. And then after that is just childcare expenses. So for about a thousand dollars a month, I cover my food, I cover my automobile and gas. And then that's kind of it. Maybe for another 300 bucks of cell phones and miscellaneous things. But outside of that, everything else is covered by my companies and everything is really, really cheap. These tips will help you protect yourself from the gluttony that takes place in economic booms. And what you've seen over these past few years is exactly that. And you're gonna see on social media and in real life, a lot of people getting hurt. And rather than taking accountability for it, they're going to turn and say, it's the politician's fault, it's this bank's fault, it's China's fault, it's Russia's fault. When in all reality, if you adjust yourself properly, you shouldn't be the victim of the changes in the economy. You should be able to dodge the bullets and take advantage of opportunity when opportunity strikes. I hope you've learned how to position yourself for this downturn. My last message is if you get hurt in this downturn, focus on your positive relationships, building your skill set to make yourself more valuable to the marketplace and doing the best that you can with your work. Money is just a tool, a concept that does not define who you really are. The downturn will pass and as long as you stay a good person, when things clear up, you'll be okay. No one wants to help out a jerk. And when things get rough, you're going to need help. Thanks again for joining me here at ENCP Life. Like, subscribe, and share this with anyone you know needs this advice. Until the next one, take care.